Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. David Harnish. I'm the chair of the music department and the liaison to the Kyoto Symposium. Um, it's wonderful to see you all here today. Thank you for coming out. Wasn't that music wonderful? Please give another round of applause for the USD Percussion Ensemble. Before we begin today's program, may I remind you that if you have a cell phone, please put it on silent or vibrate. In addition, please look around the theater to see the closest exit uh, to your seat in, in the case of an emergency. At the conclusion of Professor Jonas's presentation, I ask you, you remain seated in place until we've concluded the closing ceremony at the end of the program. If you're one of our high school guests here with your teacher, please remain in your seat until the conclusion of the program for a special encore opportunity. Lastly, for those who pre-registered, we look forward to seeing you this afternoon at 2.30 for the panel discussion featuring Professor Jonas. This discussion will be held at the Institute for Peace and Justice Theater. Now I would like to welcome Richard Virgin, USD's Vice President of University Advancement, to introduce USD President James Harris III. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you this morning uh, Dr. James Harris, President of the University of San Diego. Dr. Harris is the fourth president of the University of San Diego, the youngest Catholic institution among the nation's top 100 universities. Over the past 25 years, he was president of three universities and is the current board chair for the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. The NAACP recognized him with a leadership award for his work defending civil rights he was named one of the top 50 character building presidents in America by the John Templeton Foundation and received the case chief executive leadership award. He is an active scholar and teacher. Um, and I know this because he's actually teaching students here on the campus um, and we run into his students occasionally. He co-authored the book, Academic Leadership and Governance in higher education. Please welcome Dr. Jim Harris. Thank you, Rick, and good morning, everyone. And I wanted to uh, say thank you to Dr. Harnish for his uh, wonderful work over the years and being our liaison on campus and, and the many times that he helped introduce me to uh, to Japan and to the culture and so forth, and, and the, thank you for your leadership. Uh, I want to welcome everybody here today, and I'm especially pleased and honored to be here with the Kyoto Prize Symposium honoring uh, Professor Joan Jonas. Uh, Professor Jonas, uh, we're just, uh, again, honored and pleased to have you here, looking forward to your presentation, and we hope that this won't be the only time you're on our campus. In addition to the University of San Diego's featured Kyoto Prize laureate, Professor Jonas, please join me in welcoming her counterpart, the 2018 Kyoto Prize Laureate in Basic Sciences, Dr. Masaki Kashiwara. Would you please rise, sir, and be recognized? In the three years that I've been here, two years, we had the opportunity, my wife and I, to be in Kyoto. And one of the things that we learned about the prize winners is that they actually may or may not have had a relationship across disciplines in the past, and they become friends and colleagues, and those relationships blossom in, in the years after. Uh, and joining us this morning as well from an Inamori Foundation in Japan, we're honored to have several distinguished guests. Uh, first of all, Mrs. Shinobo in, in, in Inamore Kanazawa, who is the Executive Vice President of the Inamori Foundation. Would you please rise and rec <laughs> recognize? <laughs> We're deeply honored to have you here today and your colleagues. And I just want to uh, thank, would you please give our best wishes to your father, 
Dr. Kazu Inamore for making this day possible. I remember that he often hosts at his home. Uh, his, uh, he, he'll have people who come to the award ceremony and we had the great pleasure of having dinner at his home uh, a couple of different occasions and he's so gracious and kind. And so thank you, please thank him on my behalf. Also my pleasure to welcome Mr. Kazitu Himida, who's the Director and Secretary General of the Inamore Foundation. And sitting next to him is a long-term uh, benefactor of the university and so many organizations in this community, Mr. Malin Burnham, who helped to make this possible. So will you please rise, Malin, let's recognize you for your wonderful contribution. This wouldn't work without our local Kyoto Symposium organization and the organizations responsible for making this series of events possible in San Diego. We have with us today the chair of the board of, of that symposium organization, Mr. David Doyle. Would you please rise and be recognized? <laughs> and then also Mr. Richard Davis, the executive director and secretary is with us today. Now, it has been the tradition in the Kyoto Laureate Prize Symposium. It's now time to share with you a brief video presentation on the work of the Inamori Foundation, followed by a short account of the life of this year's Arts and Philosophy Laureate, Professor Joan Jonas. Thank you. The annual Kyoto Prize Ceremonies take place each November in Kyoto, Japan. The Kyoto Prize is Japan's highest private award for global achievement. It is given each year by the Inomori Foundation, which was founded in 1984 with the initial private funds of Dr. Kazuo Inomori, founder and chairman emeritus of Kyocera Corporation. Human beings have no higher calling than to strive for the greater good of humanity and society. The Foundation awards three prizes annually in the following fields. Advanced technology, including electronics, bio and medical technology, material science and engineering, and information science. Basic sciences, including biological, mathematical, earth and planetary sciences, astronomy and astrophysics, and life sciences, and arts and philosophy, music, arts, painting, sculpture, craft, architecture, design, theater, cinema, thought, and ethics. The Kyoto Prize Symposium is held in San Diego, California to share the ideas of prize laureates across the globe. The philosophy of the Inamori Foundation aims for a future with the proper balance between science, technology, and spiritual maturity, with the goal to contribute to the peace and prosperity of humanity. This is the core mission of the Kyoto Prize. Joan Jonas was born in New York City in 1936 and grew up surrounded by family members who were writers, musicians, and painters. Her aspiration to become an artist from an early age was influenced by frequent visits to museums, galleries, and musical events. After studying art history and sculpture at Mount Holyoke College and earning an MFA at Columbia University, she built relationships with many artists in New York in the 1960s. She studied with the choreographer Trisha Brown and was influenced by the work of John Cage and Klaus Oldenburg. In the 1970s, armed with an early home video recorder, Joan Jonas pioneered new artistic expression by integrating performance art and new media. Her labyrinth-like work was filled with multiple layers of video, sculpture, bodies, drawings, music, poems, and other elements. A prolific artist for more than five decades, Professor Jonas has often collaborated with musicians and dancers to realize improvisational works that are equally at home in the museum gallery and on the theatrical stage. Drawing on mythic stories from various cultures, 
She infuses texts from the past with the politics of the present. She says, art is communication. It's a dialogue with the past and the future. Professor Jonas has greatly influenced performance artists around the globe. Still at the forefront of the art scene, her interests in world travel, different cultures, societal roles, the environment, the behaviors of children and animals continue to be the most significant themes in her work. Her advice for young people is, love what you do and don't depend on the opinions of others. Establish a group of friends with whom you can share your ideas and discuss your work. Joan Jonas, born in New York in 1936, is Professor Emerita at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She's a major pioneer of performance and video art whose career spans from 1968 to the present day, and we hope for many more years to come. Professor Jonas initiated new artistic pressions, uh, expressions by integrating a variety of performance art and new media and has remained at the forefront of contemporary art for over 50 years, as also stated in the video. She works in video installation, sculpture, and drawing, often collaborating with musicians and dancers and communities of contemporary artists um, to realize improvisational works uh, that can be performed on a variety of stages, but also can be performed in some non-traditional spaces. Um, she frequently draws upon narratives from around the world um, uh, as inspiration for new artistic works, and including Japan, she's done a lot of work uh, building off of Japanese forms, and invests uh, texts with contemporary issues. Professor Jonas earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in Art History from Art Holyoke College in 1958, then studied sculpture at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston before receiving a Master of Fine Arts in Sculpture at Columbia University. Her first public performance was at St. Peter's Church in New York in 1968, hence part of the reason for the title of her presentation today. As decades, uh, after decades of creative work, she became professor at the State Academy of Fine Arts in Stuttgart, and then professor of visual art at Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1998. She retired from MIT in 2015. Now, last night, Professor Jonas said she worked there for 13 years, but I count 17. So we'll have to figure out uh, the, what happened there. It's probably my error. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, Joan Jonas was among a vanguard of contemporary artists in New York, akin in some respects to such luminaries as John Cage, himself a Kyoto Prize laureate in arts and philosophy in the music category, and of course, the prelude music was his composition, and other experimental artists and filmmakers. Unlike some of her male peers and predecessors, however, she was inspired by the feminist movement and showcased feminine energies and different personas. Video art was an area less dominated by men and allowed her to establish herself and search for a feminine vernacular in art as she produced series of theme productions over decades. I asked her yesterday, how many productions have you created? And she said something to the effect that she had no idea. Um, and we decided that's the role of archivists to count productions. Artists have to keep creating them. Her early life might have influenced her artistic explorations and, and directions. Since she moved a lot as a child and experienced diverse settings, there was a sense of displacement of rootedness magic and art, which together provided an outsider's view and allowed opportunities to look at life and art in unique ways, disconnected from established conventions. In addition, residing in New York uh, during her formative years allowed easy trips to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and to uh, attend operas, which all left significant impressions and inspirations. Unlike most critics and many artists, she has not maintained or acknowledged distinctions between genres of art, such as theater, um, visual arts, um, uh, plastic arts, uh, poetry, and music, and readily combines these media into new and original forms. Her work has synthesized distinctive forms together into singular performances. 
Professor Jonas's work is modernist in theme and presents aesthetic innovations that are consistently unorthodox and non-traditional. And this work has profoundly impacted artists of later generations. As she will discuss more fully in her talk, the first of her performances to use live projection was Organic Honey, a seminal and seductive alter ego in 1972. The video monitor used then and many times after was a prop, just as funnels, cones, and mirrors had been props in earlier series of productions. In the 1970s, Professor Jonas began to move between video performance art and autonomous video works and moved between featuring a few or several performers and performing solo with mediated images. While many productions were made for stages of various sorts, some were staged at abandoned lots and empty streets in places such as Lower Manhattan. In these projects, he would give performers props and simple choreography to perform. Landscapes and nature have been other venues for productions. Her dog has also become one of the performers. By wearing masks in some work, and she's, uh, she makes her own masks, uh, um, and sometimes these have been inspired by Japanese uh, no theater, and I think she may discuss uh, some of the other influences uh, she's um, been inspired by from Japan. She's also drawn while performing on stage in other productions. This disrupts the convention of theatrical storytelling to emphasize symbols and critical self-awareness. From masquerading in disguise before the camera to turning mirrors on the audience, she turns doubling and reflection into metaphors for the divide between subjective and objective visions, the loss of fixed identities, and sometimes even the fragmentation of identities. While performers, including Professor Jonas, moved while on stage, a spectacular dance presentation to wow the audience was never the purpose of her art. She, she sought instead to juxtapose various symbols and various realities, reflections, imaginaries, and possibilities, destabilizing binaries, sometimes even that between performer and audience. For many years, Professor Jonas has been traveling and living in various countries as she continues to study cultures and narratives. She is still learning. In fact, she just arrived from Venice, where an installation uh, with the theme of oceans is in progress, and she leaves tonight to return to Venice. She says that she set out to develop her own language of images, films, life, and the recognitions of her work and career via, via numerous awards, such as the Maya Darren Award from the American Film Institute in 1989, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Guggenheim Museum in 2009, and now a Kyoto Prize in Arts and Philosophy in, in 2018, these all demonstrate that she's made a major impact on the American and global art worlds and left a leg legacy that will endure and continue to influence artists in the coming years. And now to present Joan Jonas from 1968 to the present. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Joan Jonas. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, that was a Almost, I don't have to say anything, <laughs> but I will. Um, I, I want to say that I'm very happy to be in San Diego where I've spent a, a fair amount of time um, in relation to the, uh, being invited by friends from the universities and so showing my work and performing. And, but especially I would like to thank Dr. Inamori for this amazing award, I'm deeply honored to um, have received this. And it certainly does make a big difference in one's life. And I'm honored to be uh, considered in relation to the ideals of the Inamori Foundation. Growing up, I spent summers in the summer home of my maternal grandmother, Florence Dollier, in New Hampshire with a friend I would put on amateur performances and spent a lot of time in the woods and the fields that surrounded the house. I had a dog named Cindy. I've had dogs all my life and they have become a part of my work. 
Winters we lived in, I'm just fixing the mic. Winters we lived in New York City, and as a child, I went to the Metropolitan Museum and the Museum of Modern Art with my mother. My mother took me to the opera, and I brought my dolls to play with. I remember noticing male and female Wagnerian characters on the stage while playing with the dolls on my lap. My family moved six different times within New York before I turned 11. I went to two different schools, one progressive and one more conventional. At the more progressive one, I just wanted to paint. For my last two years of high school, I was sent to boarding school in Vermont. This continuous displacement led to the forming of an outsider's life view. My memory is that, okay, this is a new place. I have to adjust each time. My father lived on a boat and was constantly moving around. I never knew when he was going to show up. He spent some time in Mexico every year and had a talent for photography and cooking. He introduced me to the modernist poets and literature. He encouraged me to be an artist, I believe, because he never succeeded in his own attempts at becoming a writer. In graduate school at Columbia University, I studied early 20th century poetry, which greatly affected the way I think about the structure of the work. The form of the haiku was, a very, important, was very important to the images who were a major influence on me. My mother divorced and my mother married Dick Turner, a jazz musician in his youth and a talented amateur magician, which were both also thwarted talents. My earliest influences were magic shows in addition to the circus, Broadway musicals, and of course, 50s television and movies. My father's second wife had a sister named Jeanne Reynal, who was a mosaic artist and collector. She was very involved in the New York art scene of the time and knew Archil Gorky, Willem de Kooning, Marcel Duchamp, among others. It was through an indirect exposure to this world that I became aware of the modern art circles in New York. In university, my studies were in art history, literature, and sculpture. I then went to art school and continued with sculpture while concentrating on drawing, drawing being the basic element of my work. When I switched from sculpture to performance in the mid 60s, I had to think about this new form and consider how to work with it in order to develop a new language. I made this statement at the time. I didn't see a major difference between a poem, a sculpture, a film, or a dance. A gesture has for me the same weight as a drawing. Draw, erase, draw, erase, memory, erase. While I was studying art history, I looked carefully at the space of paintings, films, and sculpture. How illusions are created within a framed space and how to deal with a real physical space with depth and distance. When I switched from sculpture to performance, I just went to a space and looked at it. I would imagine how it would look to an audience, what they would be looking at, and how they would perceive the ambiguities and illusions of that space. An idea for a piece would come just from looking until my vision blurred. I would also begin with a mirror, a cone, a TV, a story. Sassetta and Piera Darrell Francesca are two Renaissance painters that I really loved. I was interested in the geometric forms and how the space of architecture was depicted in the space of the city. In Sassetta, I was drawn to the form, the delicate colors, the magic. In Piero, it was the placement of figures in the space of architecture, how they stood and seemed to gesture. A major direct influence was Alberto Giacometti. His figures, sometimes tiny, sometimes enormous, occupied and commanded a focused space. This element of illusion was also in the circus and the magic shows I had seen as a child. This idea of alchemy, the transformation of material, is essential. From the very beginning, nature has been the context for my work. Since childhood, I've loved the outdoors, playing in the woods in New Hampshire, putting on plays with my friends in various wild gardens, and watching thunderstorms move across the valleys. These were high points. The first time I really understood why people made up stories about gods 
was when I went to the southwest of the US and saw the landscape there. It was so overwhelming in an unexplainable way that I understood why it had to be explained by myths and stories. When I Made Wind in 1968, it was filmed outdoors on the coldest day of the year, though it was based on an indoor piece. The wind became a character and a force. The wind turned what could have been familiar everyday movements into a comedy of chaos. Forces of nature in the landscape continue to be a major presence. I was very influenced by film as well as by modernist poetry and literature. I learned so much from looking at the early films of Bertolt, Eisenstein, Godovkin, Ozu, and others. I was drawn to the idea of one image next to another and in a related way to the use of a series of close-ups to build a narrative. I was affected by the use of landscape and the contrasting close-ups of animals, flowers, children, and people. The Russians, like other early filmmakers, were attracted to the activities of everyday movement. After seeing silent films, one was more aware of how sound could be used in a particular way. When I was in high school during the 1950s in Northport, Long Island, I saw my first Japanese film. It was called Ugetsu by Kenju Mizuguchi, and it intrigued and startled me at the same time. I was taken aback by the style of acting and its imagery. I had never seen anything like it. I began my study of film by attending film screening, screenings in New York at Anthology Film Archives established by Jonas Mikas. Recently, they sponsored the restoration of my two films, Wind and Song Delay. Metaphor is an aspect of my visual language. How does one tell a story with sound and image in time? What is the function of an image? In modernist poetry, the structure of a haiku can combine two images to make a third, like Ezra Pound's In the Station of a Metro from 1913. The apparition of these faces in a crowd petals on a wet black bow. When I began to work in time-based media, I had to invent ways of structuring sequences of images. So I worked with the language of montage in composing my work. In the 1960s, when I knew I wanted to make performance-based work, I intended dance workshops, performances, and happenings by visual artists and dancers in New York and other places. I was also looking at film, painting, and sculpture, how art is a dialogue with the past and future. I am constantly looking for both familiar and strange objects in flea markets at home and away that might become props in my work. <clears throat> the objects I use are not literal adaptations of the elements of the story or concept, but are symbolic archetypal. For example, the actuality of the form, the comb, was an instrument to channel sound to the audience. I could whisper in their ears, look through it, listen to it, yell through it, sing, always directing the sound to a place. Funnel, a piece I did in 1974, was based on the form of a cone. I made many paper cones of different sizes and proportions. I started working with nine foot tin cones in 1976 and continue to be inspired by this shape. My inspiration includes travel, collecting objects, and the practices of other cultures and their rituals. Ritual is a part of my language, my own ritual, although I am interested in the ritual of other cultures. In studying art history, every painting has a story, and many practices begin in ritual. The no drama began as ritual. I studied the early periods of uh, uh, I'm sorry, I studied the early periods of art, the Minoan and the Mycenaean period. I spent a year in Greece in the 60s and spent several months in Crete because I was drawn to the Minoan myths of the women diving into the sea with dolphins. In the 1960s when I was doing research and getting prepared to go into performance, I saw the Hopi snake dance in the Southwest, which was amazing, outdoors, and beautiful. All these ideas have been continued through the years 
and have been applied in different ways to later works. They have to do with my way of performing, my way of disguising myself, and working in relation to the camera. How to alter the image for the various media and then alter what is there later, using layering devices and reflection to alter how the audience perceives what they see. I have continuously stepped from making of a performance to making autonomous films and video works to installation and back while moving images and ideas from each to the other. The first prop that I used was a mirror. And as you saw in Wind, we had costumes with mirrors pasted on them. I got the idea from reading the Argentinian writer, Jorge Luis Borges. I was very intrigued by how he wrote about mirrors and space and the infinite multiplication of space as a library, the endless library that went on and on. So I made several performances with mirrors. These pieces consisted of a group of about 17 people walking very slowly, very carefully, moving in choreographed movements in the space. The mirrors faced the audience. In turn, the audience saw the reflected fractured space, the other performers and themselves. So what you're seeing now is a recent reconstruction from notes and photographs of mirror piece one and two, which was originally performed in the late 60s and early 70s. The mirror was a metaphor for me, a device to alter the image and to include the audience as reflection, making them uneasy as they view themselves in public. The fragility of the mirrors and glass that could actually break also caused discomfort. Beauty with an edge offset. Other outdoor pieces also involve the view viewpoint of the audience. My early work developed in a particular context and place. In the 1960s, some parts of New York looked like ruins, parts of the Lower West Side, for example, and the docks nearby along the Hudson River. These were places to explore. The first outdoor piece, Jones Beach, in 19, Jones Beach piece in 1970, was about perception in the distance, how sound is delayed by the distance. One sees the action and split seconds later, one hears the sound. Space is flattened in the distance. Certainly one can relate to the history of painting and representation of flatness and the idea of trying to create the illusion of depth through perspective or color and form. I went to Japan in 1970 and saw the No Theater. It had a significant influence on me and my work. It was then that I started experimenting with masks and used them in the outdoor works. Masks hid my face from the audience and gave me another persona. They inspire me to move in a different way, behave in a different way, and mask my personality, which I like. The sound of wood hitting wood in the no inspired me to work with wood blocks clapping the sound delay in my outdoor performance. What you're seeing now is a piece called Nova Scotia Beach Dance. Although the piece was happening on the beach itself, it was seen from above by a group standing on the cliff above. I've spent every summer since 1970 in Cape Breton, Canada, and every summer I record the landscape and perform for the video camera. When I moved to Soho in 1968, it was relatively empty and artists were able to move into old, recently abandoned factory lofts that had the beauty of another time. It wasn't expensive to find a place to perform or exhibit one's work. You could work on the streets, lots, and docks without getting permission from the city. My performance and video reflected that setting. It was an atmosphere, grainy and rough. The performance is, this performance is delay, delay from 1972 with a group of people who as usual were friends and artists. For instance, Gordon Mata Clark is in this piece. I would work on location, in this case, the empty lots of the Lower West Side of New York for a few months with ideas developed at Jones Beach and for the Nova Scotia Beach Dance and then rehearse with the group before performing in public. For delay, delay, the audience sat on the roof of a loft building on Chambers Street, overlooking these empty lots, 
where old factory buildings had been torn down. This work dealt with the perception of a distance from an overhead view. The film Song Delay was based on Delay Delay. It was shot in this location in order to recreate the illusion of the space. In other words, the distance and the activity over a wide viewpoint. I worked with the filmmaker Robert Fiore, and we used two lenses, a telephoto lens, since you wouldn't be able to see the sound delay in the distance, through a normal lens, and a wide angle lens to record the area of the empty lots. It was pure accident that boats went by up and down the Hudson River in the background as we recorded. We were very lucky. Every time we started to record the wood clapping sound delay, the boats went by. Here we see an image of Organic Honey's visual telepathy, the first video performance that I ever did. I bought a video camera in Japan in 1970 and started working with closed circuit video systems, which was quite a revolutionary video system at that time. Artists seeing themselves live performing and recording at the same time. This was unlike recording in film where you can't see the results of a recording until later. It was a radical moment. This device altered my way of performing. I began to perform for the camera. I didn't want to be recognized as myself, so I wore masks. I dressed up. I played with the disguise. I developed imaginary characters or states of mind, alter egos. In a way, I found myself in the mirror works and through video transformations. Organic Honey's visual telepathy evolved as I found myself continuously investigating my own image in the monitor of my video machine. I then bought a mask of a doll's face, which transformed me into an erotic seductress. I named this TV persona Organic Honey. I became increasingly obsessed with following the process of my own theatricality as my images fluctuated between the narcissistic and a more abstract representation. The risk was to become too submerged in solipsistic gestures. In exploring the possibility of female imagery, thinking always of a magic show, I attempted to fashion a dialogue between my different disguises and the fantasies they suggested. This was in part inspired by the feminist movement of the time. I always kept my eye on the small monitor in the performance area in order to control the image. I just wanna say the piece was also about questioning what is female. There was a live camera in the performance space. At first I operated the camera, but later I had a camera person as performer. All movements and shots were set up beforehand and rehearsed. There is a small monitor in the space so that I, the performer, could frame my actions. The audience saw this live performance simultaneously with the image transmitted from the camera to the projection and or the monitor. This was often a detail of the live action so the experience was a, of a double narrative linked. In subsequent video performance, I continued to explore this space of perception. I am interested in drawing during performance. A drawing in a performance is different from drawing alone in my studio where there are no witnesses. The performance affects the drawing. As organic honey, I drew for the monitor while looking at the monitor and not at the drawing. 
I think continuously of how to work with screens, how to design the screen, and how to work with projection on the screen. I am interested in creating my own special effects using my own technological trickery. Mirage from 1976 was designed particularly for the anthology film archives. It was the last of a series of video performances working with early black and white technology and was structured in relation to the projection screen of that cinema. Because one could change the size and shape of the screen, various movements were performed in relation to these shapes. A large monitor turned on its side played pre-recorded videos such as May Windows and Good Night, Good Morning. These works were recorded by a camera turned on its side to fit the vertical format. In this piece, I included two 16 millimeter films, a drawing film and a film of volcano eruptions, both projected. However, the screens were mostly blank, serving as backdrops for my movements on the small black wooden table or stage. Sometimes if the screen was backlit, one could see through the screen and we performed behind the screen, working with the transparency. I did not include the live camera linked to the closed circuits circuit in this performance. Props included a group of nine foot tin cones, a small hoop, and a Central American wooden mask of a man. For the 30 minute film shot by Babette Mangold, I made a series of drawings on a blackboard, drawing and erasing in this case, images or symbols that were part of my vocabulary. This is a weather symbol and a heart I draw over and over again a basic iconic image. I was inspired by the films of Maya Deren in 1976, the American filmmaker who spent time in Haiti filming the, the drawings, filming the voodoo rituals. Practitioners were making drawings over and over again on the dark ground with lines of white powder. I refer to this piece and I've used this drawing film in other works. Mirage is a piece that I go back to in order to develop certain aspects of it in new work. It interests me to go back to an early work, take a part of it, and work, and work in relation to other material. I'm interested in how the content is altered by juxtaposition or by being in a different context. I sat on top of a television set, which was turned on its side in a vertical position and made a series of gestures. The image of the cone inspired me to include volcanoes footage. The whole piece involved the idea of opposites. It was, the abstract, it was an abstract piece dealing with light and dark. This is the juniper tree, the first version. In 1976, I started working with narrative or storytelling inspired by prose fiction. As with the mirror, the video, the outdoor work, narrative, I would say, was another altering medium in which the image relates to a story and is affected by the story. This is the first version of the juniper tree based on a fairy tale by the Grimm brothers. It was made for children, which interests me to have children react and respond to my work. I later altered that piece and turned it into a work not just for children, though children could have seen it. I made a structure or stage set for instance, I represented the tree with a ladder, which is an iconic way of representing a tree. The wood and rope structure was the house. I made red and white drawings. When I began working with a story, I analyze it, take it apart, and I note the colors. In this case, red and white. Red as blood and white as snow. Very traditional fairy tale colors. In this particular fairy tale, there is a boy and a girl. In the performance for children, we played all the characters. In this version, I represented all the characters. On the red cloth, I drew an anatomical heart and turned it into a face, representing the boy. On the white cloth for the girl, I drew a valentine heart and turned that into a face, each step at different moments in the performance. I then hung the drawings on the wall. They became part of the set. I make drawings in performance relating to the content while exploring each time a different medium. This was in the Whitechapel Gallery in London because it was before it was renovated. It was slightly altered for the beautiful space. Installations are adjusted for various 
situations. In 1994, when I had a show at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, it was the first time since stage sets that I had a major show of installations that was translations of performances. I also made a new work that was at first an installation and then was translated into a performance in collaboration with a theater group in Amsterdam. It was, re it was called Revolted by the Thought of Known Places, based on an Irish 8th century epic poem, Sweeney Astray. This is, the in this is the installation of Organic Honey. I wanted the audience to experience the work in a different way. I take all the elements for the installation, the video, the sound, the structure, the screens, the props, and I reconstruct them. In other words, I take the performance apart so it's not based on a linear time, but exists in a different experience of time. The audience chooses what to look at and when. As they walk through the piece, the sounds of the different videos play together. Later, when I started working with more lyrical sound, there were different solutions with each installation. This is what interests me now, the form of the installation, this way of exhibiting a work in a space that I construct. This is the installation version of Mirage, as I mentioned earlier, the two films side by side, the drawing film and the film I made to go with it. The second film consisted of footage shot in the early 70s and includes footage shot off the TV at the time because I wanted to bring everyday current events into the work and juxtapose what I was doing in the privacy of my studio with what was going on in the world around me. Since the juniper tree, when I work with a narrative or a story, I'm very aware of what's going on in the world. The juniper tree relates to the idea of being the female, for instance, and in this case with Mirage, the Vietnam War, Nixon, and so forth are referred to. This is the performance version of Volcano Saga. I began to work with projections and color as backdrops, reflecting the narrative and place in relation to the space of the performance. The video is edited to form a parallel narrative to the live action in and around it. In this case, it's on three different screens. Two projections show continuous moving images, narratives relating to the story. The third screen is behind a piece of glass that I stand behind at times and use as a sounding board, knocking on it or painting on it. The projections are a series of color images or stills that I took when I visited Iceland to work on the piece and record the landscape. I continue to explore this way of telling a story. I do not illustrate the story. I represent it often using metaphor. The projection and the live performance form parallel narratives. I perform in the image and beside it, always in relation to the video. I worked with the composer Alvin Lussier in this case. In each of my works, I've either made my own soundtracks or worked with a composer. Tilda Swinton played the main part in Volcano Saga. The characters in an Icelandic saga are more three-dimensional as they are based on real historical figures. Fairy tales were two-dimensional, cardboard cutouts, either good or evil. I wanted to have an experienced performer, in this case Tilda, to pay, play the part of Gudrun, the main character, a woman who is married four times. I dreamt I was standing outside near a stream. I was wearing a headdress on my head, but I felt that it didn't become me, so I was anxious to change it. A lot of people warned me not to, but I paid no attention to them and tore the headdress off my head and threw it into the stream. And that was the end of that dream. She has a series of four dreams that foretold her future. Ron Vorder, an actor from the Worcester Group, played the seer who interpreted these dreams. After several large-scale epic works, I started to think in miniature terms and not have myself appear live. I began to make a series of sculptural objects long wooden boxes echoing the shape of a cone, but squared. 
Inside the larger end is a stage with a video backdrop. The viewer stands and looks into the box. This piece was the first one I did. It was called Tap Dancing. It's a poetic documentary about a form of dance that they do in Canada. And it's based on a particular folk dancing. It's called Step Dancing. This is a little girl. All the children learn these dances. And I made a number of props and objects that represent the stage set within this miniature theater. I've made six of these, and they're all different subjects and different shapes. This is My New Theater 3. You can also see another My New Theater behind this. This is another example of drawing in relation to my body. I put a wet sheet over me, and I drew its outline on the sheep sheet in charcoal. It looks like my skeleton on the outside of my body. After this, I began to do these drawings in performances by tracing over a big piece of Japanese paper held against my body. I've made many of these drawings. The drawing on the blackboard is of one of my objects that I collect. So in 1968, when I began to publicly perform, I had the desire to develop my own language. I feel the following works, my most recent, are a coming together of all the ideas of the early works. I have developed them into longer and more complicated narratives. That's my dog, Zeno. I mean, she's passed away. Now my dog's name is Ozu, actually. Lines in the Sand was based on a long poem called Helen in Egypt, written by H.D. or Hilda Doolittle. H.D. was an American writer living in the early part of the 20th century who was analyzed by Sigmund Freud in the 1930s. I also include quotes from her memoir, Tribute to Freud. It was written right before the Second World War. I grew up in the Second World War. War is a background condition. There's a, second, there's a section from H.D.'s book about her analysis of Freud that refers to this time before World War II in a certain way. Quote, there was something beating in my brain. Helen of Troy was blamed for the Trojan War. Of course, a woman had to be blamed. H.D.'s account is based on a classical reference that stated that Helen never went to Troy, but went to Egypt. The Helen that was in Troy was a phantom, a copy, and that was actually a trade war. I was thinking of the fact that we are still at war and that the true reasons are never made explicit. I am interested in these historic mythic female figures and the echoing theme of the double. For part of my research, I visited Las Vegas, where we recorded scenes in a casino called Luxor. The fake Luxor was juxtaposed against the real Egypt represented in the work by the photographs that my grandmother took when she visited Egypt at the end of the 19th century. This was an echoing of the theme of the double. I do not play Helen. There are two of us performing, echoing the real and the fake. Ragini Haas is performing with me. In this case, I'm making a drawing of a step pyramid that involves moving with my body while making a mark on a large piece of paper that's suitable to the scale of the performance space or stage. I often become obsessed with one form, in this case, the pyramid and the sphinx, drawing the image over and over again in real time for the performance or the video. Around 2003, I started to develop the shape, the scent, the feel of things. The title of the piece was based on a book. Oh, but no, sorry. the title of the piece is, ba is a quote from H.D.'s writing but the piece was based on a book by Abby Warburg, images from the region of the Pueblo Indians of North America. In the early part of the 20th century, Warburg, a German art historian, visited the Southwest and saw certain ceremonies of an indigenous peoples, the Hopi. 
Through his writings, I returned to my own memory of seeing the snake dance of the Hopi in Arizona. The piece was designed for an immense space in the basement of an old factory that became the exhibition space of Dia Beacon. In 2005, I began to work with Jason Moran, the jazz composer, who composed music and played live in the piece. This has been a long lasting and important collaboration. We continue to work together for reading Dante, reanimation, and they come to us without a word. And we're going to perform uh, reanimation in Japan in December, which I'm excited about, and I think Jason too. I designed a large screen on wheels that moved in and out of the corridor sideways, moving towards and away from the audience, shrinking and expanding the space. The screen appeared as a fourth wall, advancing, receding, and moving out of the space. Major props include a stuffed coyote, a long snake-like structure on wheels, and various sound devices that I played in relation to Jason's sounds. The piece was really developed around the text, which was developed into a script, which I worked on for two years. I also, spent, I also spent two years recording video in many locations. My research took me to the desert landscapes of the southwest of America and Southern California and woods and beaches of Canada. The haunting images from Salton Sea for, for me represented the decay of a certain aspect of American culture and became a backdrop for the song Pastures of Plenty by Wood, Woody Guthrie, which was sung um, during the shots of of um, the Salton Sea. Serpent as weather deity. Serpent and lightning shed. I think it's Bruce Bailey. No, I swear. Yeah, I'll leave it like this. Huh? This scene where I paint the snake is an example of how layers of action occur in relation to the space and the projection. I move with the music to paint the snake in a condensed period of time, while other, the other performer, Ragini, pulls and swings the snake-like row of linked canvases on wheels. Projected behind this is an image of a stick being used as a drawing tool for, to create curving lines in the sand. Animal dance. I want to say that I never uh, represented the Hopi culture in my piece. So this, 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 my snake had nothing to do with the Hopi snake dance, out of respect to the Hopi people. Masses of limestone. Tertiary rock. Higher plateaus. Here is the final scene, only possible because of the unique layout of the Dia space. The character Warburg walks down the length of the enormous warehouse space, past the columns, the metal doors roll open, letting in a flood of light as Warburg leaves the sanitarium and the music plays. Reanimation was based on the Icelandic writer Haldor Laxness's Under the Glacier, a work of fiction written in 1968. I shot it partly in Norway and partly in my loft in New York. While in Norway, I met a Sami singer named Andy Sambi. We recorded his songs, which are part of the soundtrack, his Sami songs. But he made a special uh, song for me because he didn't want to sing the traditional Sami songs out of respect. 
We recorded his songs, which are part of the soundtrack. Jason Moran composed and played the music for the performance version after the first version of the installation was shown in Castle for Documented 13. Reanimation was my first piece where I wanted to include questions about the problems in the environment in my work. Of course, I had always been thinking about these things. I was struck by Laxness writing and its focus on the poetic presence of glaciers, nature, and its creatures. I used crystals in the piece because glaciers are made of crystals. Because my work is always set in the present, I had to take into consideration when creating the piece that glaciers are melting. I used footage from a 1973 video called Disturbances, shot in a swimming pool with shots of women swimming underwater. From my time in Kitakusha, Japan, I had worked with soji screens. So I re reconfigured the piece and had these paper screens made for the video projections for the installation. It really alters the perception of the image because it divides the image into a grid pattern. The audience can walk into the architectural space and be surrounded by the projected images. Also part of the piece, but outside of the room like space, are two minor theaters playing separate video works, related to the work, of course. In the performance of reanimation, I made a drawing with ice and ink. This is an image of the drawing projected through the crystal and metal structure. I thought of the black ink on the white snow as a kind of polluting element. This is just another example of how I work with drawing. And here I draw on the snow with paint. This is an example of Jason Moran and I working together. I love this motif and he's reused it in different ways. I'm making drawings of birds as fast as I can and sliding piece, pieces of paper away, one after another, inspired by the music. I was particularly inspired by one of Haldor Laxness's description of a bird standing against a storm, a delicate bird. He's, he, he describes the bird as being fragile, but able to stand against a the storm. They come to us without a word. I was invited to represent the United States at the Vienna Biennale in 2005. Again, this is an example of one work segueing into another. I quoted laxness about bees and the miraculous aspect of nature. I wanted to make a piece about animals and include children as performers. For me, this represented the fact of our fragile environment that children will inherit. In each room, there are two projections. One concerned the main subject, the bees, the fish, the wind, and the home room in which the children drew animals, for instance. The other projection concerned ghost stories from the oral tradition of Cape Breton, Canada. I thought of the ghosts of creatures. This was in the wind room.
these um, young people, now four years older, are in my present work in Venice um, in the video. And um, I'm very happy about that. It's called Moving Off the Land. Um, so I have to find my place. In this piece, stream or river, flight or pattern, birds are a major presence in my work. I also continue to work with children. I recorded video in Vietnam, Spain, Singapore, and Italy. I projected the videos on a wall in my loft and then performed in front of the projections, as I've done so often throughout the years. The thread of my work from the very beginning has always been my role as a performer. I step into a piece and move, guided by the music, the text, the props, and other performers. I continue to explore these ideas in my recent piece about the ocean moving off the land. The situation facing the planet is dire, and I am profoundly saddened by this crisis. However, I am grateful through my work to have gained a deeper understanding for creatures both in the ocean and on the land. I believe if we understand the importance of these miraculous creatures, we can better understand ourselves and live in harmony. <laughs> anyway, I get moved by the subject, especially thinking about the present situation. But I'm very glad. Thank you so much. And um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So much, Professor Jonas, for that presentation. It's now time to mark the successful conclusion of the 2019 Kyoto Prize Symposium. Please welcome to the stage the president of the Kyoto Symposium Organization, Mr. David Doyle. Thank you. Congratulations, congratulations KSO team, we have done it again. I am proud to announce the official conclusion of this year's Kyoto Symposium events. And what a terrific ending, Professor Jonas, thank you so much. What a inspiring combination of continuity and evolution, beautiful. I'm personally very proud to bring to San Diego these honored laureates of the Kyoto Prize. The prize is an international award each given each year in Kyoto to just three individuals who have enlarged our collective future through extraordinary contributions to advanced technology, basic sciences, and arts and philosophy. The Inamori Foundation, as you saw, by its founder, Dr. Kasua Inamori, created the Kyoto Prize in 1984. San Diego and the host universities had the unique honor to be the only North American site where the Kyoto Prize laureates come to celebrate and share the insights and inspiration that led to their selection. We again express our enormous gratitude to the Inamori Foundation for choosing San Diego as the first city to share the Kyoto, to share with Kyoto the celebration of the Kyoto Prizes. Thank you. The ideas and achievements of each of our 2018 laureates have fundamentally affected our world. Dr. Carl Dyseroff, who unfortunately 
had to depart this morning and couldn't be with us today, has unlocked keys to the biggest puzzle of all, the mind, by using light technology to control brain cell activity. Dr. Masaki Kashiwara has profoundly influenced the world of mathematics by discovering new applications of algebraic analysis. And Professor Joan Jonas, as you have just experienced, has revolutionized the art world through her unique combination of performance art and electronic media. We have been moved by your brilliance and passion for solving mysteries of the mind, mathematics, and media in our world. Thank you so much. If you could please stand one more time so we can express our appreciation. My final remark is to say thank you to the individuals and universities who have worked so hard and so well together to make each year's Kyoto Prize Symposium a success, including this 2019 symposium. We're honored to bring the insight and mission of the Kyoto Prize, moving humankind in positive directions to our San Diego community each year. I look forward to celebrating with all of you at the 2020 Kyoto Symposium next spring. Thank you. <laughs>